Uh, okay, so let me give a brief introduction. Uh, it's uh, April 19th, mm, yes. uh, 2017. We're at the Computer History Museum. I'm uh, interviewing Stephen Su uh, from Itri in Taiwan, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, some of his background and specifically uh, his work on the uh, original iPhone uh, camera system. So, Stephen, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, just as an introduction to how we, uh, how you got to that program, I'd like to actually go back to the very beginning. Where were you born? And uh, tell me a little bit about your upbringing and how you found yourself into the world of technology. So just give me a brief introduction there. Okay. Um, my name is Steven Su, originally um, from Taiwan, born and raised there until I was about uh, 14 years old. Then I came to the uh, United States for uh, high school, college at Berkeley, uh, master at Caltech before going to work for Motorola uh, Semiconductor Factory in oh, Phoenix. So uh, before you go, so you even came here for high school. Did your family move here, or how did that um, come my to be? brothers and my mom, uh, uh, as usual during that time, uh, a lot of dads uh, uh, stay in Taiwan and send their family uh, to U.S. for education. I see. So my dad was in Taiwan during all those years. My mother went back to Taiwan after uh, two of my younger brothers uh, went into college. I see. So, and you went to uh, where for undergraduate? Uh, Cal Berkeley, here. And uh, what did you study there? I was studying uh, electrical engineering and computer science mm -hmm. uh, before going to uh, semiconductor with uh, Caltech for my master. Then after working for Motorola Semiconductor uh, Factory as an applications engineer, I went back to get my MBA from Kellogg Okay. Yeah, Northwestern. Yeah. Who did you study with at Caltech? Who were the major professors that you worked with there? Uh, Nicholas, Professor Nicholas, yeah. Okay. Did you uh, interact with Carver Mead at all? Uh, no, no, it, it was a very short stint. Originally going for the uh, PhD program, but uh, met with a couple of people from um, Bell Labs, and we talked about uh, studying our own stuff. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, went to this. Uh, a rotation engineering program at uh, Motorola, uh -huh. and the manager uh, at the Motorola uh, encouraged me to uh, do things like he did by going for an MBA degree and returning to uh, Motorola. But as you know, most MBA students do, like after graduation, the opportunities from China came up. So seven of us uh, graduated in that year went to Hong Kong to work on uh, uh, China business. None of uh, the seven people uh, were originally from Hong Kong. I see. Yeah, so, so we stayed there, you know, uh, through the returning of Hong Kong to China through 1997. Um, but at that time, you know, we were everywhere in China and also, also Southeast Asia, et cetera. Okay, tell me a little bit, um, so when did you come to the United States? What year? Uh, I remember very vividly. It was the Christmas of 1980. 1980? Nobody was on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this wasn't the America I was told. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been quite a shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, Visalia in California. Uh, nothing like California. <laughs> <laughs> Just next to Fresno, you know. To, <laughs> oh, my. No, no store was open during Christmas. <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, and then uh, you went to high school, and then when did you graduate from UC Berkeley? What year? I graduated in 1988. Okay, and uh, then you went to Caltech, and mm. uh, and then you started working at Motorola. What year did you start there? Mm, 1989 to 1992. Okay, and what programs did you work on while at Motorola? The first year I was uh, uh, in the rotational engineering program uh, as they had, so mm -hmm. I rotated through IC design, uh, sensors, uh, applications engineering, and also um, um, uh, semiconductor modeling. Mm -hmm. I ended up staying with the uh, uh, marketing size of uh, application engineering. So I was designing 
uh, kits to demonstrate different sensor products, different uh, uh, ICs for uh, uh, motor control. Okay. Yeah. And, and that was before I went on to Northwestern's uh, Kellogg program for uh, a, a dual degree between MBA and uh, uh, manufacturing management. Okay. So what years were you at Kellogg? Uh, 1993 to 1994. Okay. And uh, so then some people from China contacted you and or how no, did that, it was tell me how that happened? No, it was mostly uh, uh, in 1993 uh, summer, uh, between two years of uh, MBA program, many of us went to China for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a learning trip. Okay. And from that group, uh, uh, most of uh, the seven of us were well, from that group ended up going with different companies to uh, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with uh, the Boston Consulting Group, uh, Hong Kong office back then. So we were all recruited from U.S. Then went there for different uh, fields, etc. Yeah. So as part of BCG, were you then you were consulting with? Chinese companies to help? Chinese companies and also uh, Western companies oh, uh, looking to get into, get into China. China. Yeah. And were these companies in a wide variety of areas? Are they semiconductor related or what was the? Well, the uh, business of BCG tend to uh, uh, spread widely uh, between different industries. So I was working with uh, ID companies, uh, semiconductor companies, consumer product companies, and also uh, some local t uh, Chinese companies, yeah. So very broad. Uh, very broad range. Very broad My range. first assignment was with the uh, oil industry in Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> you had to do a very fast study and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. help them. And so, um, so then tell me, that was in 93, 94? 94, 94, between 94 and 98. Mm -hmm. uh, the returning of Hong Kong to uh, China was in 1997. So mm -hmm. I saw the fireworks in person <laughs> <laughs> in 1997. Then after 1998, uh, uh, my grandpa passed away, so I had the opportunity to uh, uh, go back to Taiwan and decided to go back to Taiwan and work for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I chose this company called uh, Primax, P-R-I-M-A-X. Uh, the person who, who recruited me there uh, was uh, from McKinsey, Taiwan. Mm. And he sort of attracted my attention uh, with a consulting background by working for a pretty much a, 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 a small to medium sized manufacturing company uh, back that time. Mm -hmm. the Chairman uh, Raymond and also uh, uh, later on my direct supervisor uh, Brian Young uh, were very good in uh, looking out for the future. So when I decided to go back to Taiwan, I did not look elsewhere, but uh, went into this company uh, serving two years as the uh, head of the corporate development, sort of like a, a strategy office mm -hmm. for the chairman. Then after two years in- and What was their product? What were, what were they manufacturing? They were in mostly uh, OEM, ODM uh, manufacturing business for uh, computers, uh, a little bit for uh, mobile phones before I joined them, mm -hmm. and uh, office products such as shredder, projectors, et cetera. Yeah. So they were purely manufacturing, no design? For, uh, well, we design on the engineering part, but no own brands. Mm -hmm. So most of the customers are from US, Japan, and Europe. So you did some design work as well as, or the company did some design work as well as manufacturing? Yes, uh, I would say uh, mostly all the product and engineering design, but because we do not own the the, the brands, so we have to go mostly with what the customers uh, prefer, et cetera. Right, yeah. right. And th this was a big business in Taiwan at the time, especially PC-oriented, you know, design and manufacturing, right? Yes, yes. So this is in, I joined the company in uh, 1998, uh, soon after uh, my four year stay mm -hmm. uh, with BCG in Hong Kong. Uh, at that time, uh, 
TSMC uh, was a little bit uh, beyond 10 years in history, mm -hmm. uh, starting showing some promise. And at that time, uh, Honghai, or uh, sometimes known as Foxconn, right. uh, was just starting to uh, establish itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But most of the Taiwanese uh, uh, IT, ICT industry are in uh, OEM, ODM manufacturing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, very little um, brands uh, coming from Taiwan. At that time, Acer, Asus uh, was still having uh, OEM, ODM manufacturing and brands all in the same company because their customers uh, do not view their brands as a, a threat. Right. So allow them to stay with uh, one entity. But later on, as their brand's business became larger, uh, they were forced to uh, separate into different companies. Right. Okay, so how long did you stay with this? Uh, Premax, is it? Premax, uh, yes. How long did you stay with uh, that? And I stayed with Premax from 1998 till uh, 2008. So uh, over a bit over 10 years. Okay, yeah. so it was your involvement with that company which led you to the Apple program that we're yes. talking about. So here. after two years as the uh, uh, chief corporate uh, development head for the chairman, uh, as agreed before, uh, I went into the uh, uh, product line business. Mm -hmm. So I was the senior director for mobile accessory product. At that time, we were working uh, for the previously uh, market leaders like uh, Motorola, Ericsson, Siemens, uh, uh, Alcatel. Um, so after I joined the, uh, the, the, the business unit as the head of uh, mobile accessory product line, uh, there has been some change in the market leader. So at that time, it was uh, Nokia overtaking Motorola, Ericsson, mm -hmm. Siemens. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the first few years, uh, we made a, a, a big progress in becoming Nokia's first uh, manufacturing outsource uh, partner mm. in mobile accessories. So I was a uh, winner of two leading prim uh, Taiwan companies to win that. Uh, that, that, that job, uh, working for Nokia on the mobile accessories. So what, uh, what specific accessories were you making for them? Or, and were you designing as well as manufacturing? Yes, we uh, co-designed, uh, but uh, responsible for all the manufacturing and, and logistic outsourcing management, etc. So we uh, made uh, various products for uh, Nokia uh, at the time. Uh, from Bluetooth headsets, uh, uh, phone stands. Uh, but Sorry, what was it? Uh, the, the, the stands that yeah. uh, the, 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 sometimes we call charger stand okay. or a, a display stand mm -hmm. that you don't see it nowadays, but at that time it was uh, uh, pretty relevant. But what was uh, uh, special uh, was within Premax, we had a product line of uh, digital steel camera. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there was no camera in the mobile phones. Mm -hmm. But people recognized that besides talking over the phone, we could send text uh, and also send images. Mm -hmm. So at that time, no video uh, sent from the mobile phone yet. So uh, I remember very vividly, um, we uh, 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 competed very hard for mobile uh, accessory business from uh, Nokia uh, a few years a uh, couple of years down the road, uh, they had this need of putting camera accessories, accessory for mobile phones. So uh, we use what we uh, knew from making digital camera. And we provided some uh, product uh, knowledge and also manufacturing capabilities for Nokia to introduce to the world the first add-on camera to the uh, mobile phone. So it was a combination of uh, camera and uh, earphones in one, we call camera headset. <laughs> uh, it was a very uh, uh, long wire product, let's put it that way. But so it was not integrated into no, the phone, no, it, was it, was a, it was on a headset? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, it was uh, connected through uh, their 
uh, popcorn connector mm -hmm. to the uh, Nokia phone. And with that connector, there's also a headset. Mm -hmm. So you, you could um, pull out that uh, camera, uh, take one photo each time. Mm -hmm. and you would go right into the phone that you could do something with it, but you could not have preview, you could not store multiple uh, photos uh, without connecting to the, the, the phones. Uh, however, the product was a, a big revenue for us because it went into every phone box that they had. And at that time, Nokia was already the market leader. So uh, we saw at least millions of that particular accessory. But just about the same time that Nokia introduced the camera headset, uh, even in the development stage, we were contacted by Motorola at that time, my customer as well. But again, that they tried to do the same thing. So uh, we quickly designed with them. It was a different concept, a much smaller product connect to the uh, mob uh, mobile phone of Moto. And almost at the same time, uh, we help two of the world's biggest competitors <laughs> with the first of the kind uh, products. But in uh, neither case was it part of the phone; it was an accessory. They were all add-on the accessories. Phone. They right. were all add-on accessories that and not go into inbox. So uh, as profitable as mobile accessory is, usually is higher margin but fewer products mm -hmm. because you you buy it off the shelf, uh, not with the phone. However, at that time, having the ability to take picture and send it over the phone is a, uh, w w was a very big uh, uh, marketing and also product scheme for both companies. And so Nokia we sold millions. Right, and Nokia shipped this integrated headset and phone with every phone, is that? With certain models certain of Certain models of the phone. Yeah, high-end phones. High-end mm -hmm. phones, okay. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they have still, today we, we know Apple has this uh, iOS OS. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at that time, it was Symbian for mm -hmm. Nokia. Right, Symbian was a big, uh, yeah. right. And what was the, why had you originally gotten into the digital camera market? What are the applications you were addressing before the phone application came along? The company, Premax, purchased a traditional, um, film camera company from Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, because at that time the film business was you know declining mm -hmm. and the company had a small team of doing digital camera and it was uh, very early and much more behind for example uh, 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 Fujifilm from Japan mm -hmm. and as well as Kodak hired George Fisher from Moto and was trying to do uh, digital camera so Premax purchased the company having the thought that they could still uh, make money from the traditional camera, but also uh, made way into a digital camera. But as usual, you know, things did not pan out as we expected. So the life cycle for the traditional camera uh, went much shorter. And the uh, business for digital camera came out much faster. However, the mobile phone with camera first started with add-on, uh, next with the embedded, you know, overwhelm everybody. So mm -hmm. uh, very soon that Apple came to us and asking uh, with our capabilities of making uh, digital steel camera as well as mobile phone camera add-on accessory to help them uh, design this two megapixel camera modules to go into the first iPhone. So I forget, was the iPhone the first one that integrated the camera into the, into the uh, phone itself? They were not the first. They, they were uh, smaller companies like uh, uh, Sony, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, tried that before. And, and also for uh, Nokia, uh, and much more for Nokia than Motorola at the time, uh, because Nokia was the market leader. Motorola was declining as well. Mm -hmm. so, so for Nokia, we also made uh, a camera products uh, from the first generation camera headset to the next generation uh, uh, stand-alone camera, but you are able to take multiple pictures and uh, connect through uh, physical connectors with the 
the, the mobile phones, we also make camera embedded in uh, charger stand. So you could uh, uh, have front end camera when you are doing conference call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first generation of iPhone, the camera uh, was all looking out, not uh, mm -hmm. looking at yourself. Back, and yeah. later on, they have dual camera, etc. Then right. also camera went into uh, notebook. Right. So, uh, so you're already shipping to Nokia and to Motorola. Did you have your own st own brand or own standalone product that you sold as an accessory, or just no, this through is those all two companies? For, uh, uh, these uh, brand companies, yeah, okay. no own brands. Okay. So, were you surprised when you got a call from Apple to? do this or it has been on our radar screen for Apple because uh, Premax uh, uh, at that time was a big uh, notebook accessory company as well so mm -hmm. uh, they were the number two uh, mouse makers next to Logitech but okay. nothing under its its own brand but okay. in terms of market share for OEM ODM manufacturing Premax was very large in uh, mouse products. So Apple uh, was a uh, Premax customer mm -hmm. uh, for other products, but uh, uh, going to uh, iPhone was uh, pretty key because the iPhone surprised Nokia as well. So did, when they approached you, did they tell you what the product was for? Or Usually they, these uh, brand companies are pretty uh, secretive right. uh, uh, from the start. Apple. <laughs> uh, even Moto and even Nokia uh -huh. at, at that time. So I remember that uh, Moto uh, sent me through a fax asking our capability of making a camera accessory. Uh, the, the, the shape and form uh, were, were not even close <laughs> to the final product. I answered back with a fax and we, we had a deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and some of the products, you know, they were, uh, they were told to be for example, rectangular in shape, they, but they came back. Uh, the, the real product later was oval in shape. <laughs> you know, many stories like that. Uh, so Apple was pretty secret at the time. At that time, we were not even able to uh, communicate to our uh, shareholders that we made product for Apple. So yeah. for the first few generations, uh, we would have paid a hefty penalty if we say we are Apple suppliers, not oh, like today. Uh, yeah. After uh, uh, Tim Cook had opened up this uh, uh, information to the public. So before, you know, uh, uh, we had to continuously deny that we made products for Apple <laughs> because the supply chain was pretty uh, extensive in Taiwan. So almost like you could not really hold out people from, <laughs> right. you know, knowing so, that you are making it for Apple. So, Apple. Do you remember when you first were contacted by Apple? What what year? What? Time? Uh, it was in 2005, just about two years before they launched the first iPhone in 2007. And did they have a very clear specification, or they were just, you know, was it a? General? Initially, it wasn't too clear on the uh, camera module uh, uh, itself, especially on the iPhone side, uh, but we were told about the specs that had to go into the camera module. But uh, pretty soon, because you have to know everything about the, the camera, so you know, uh, uh, more information came to us. And how, um, how unique was their request? Was, there, was what they were asking for fairly easy to accomplish, or did it require some significant development on your part? A few things that came to mind. Uh, Apple was uh, pretty uh, involved in terms of um, every product design. Mm -hmm. uh, as I, I mentioned, as an OEM ODN supplier, we are pretty good when it comes to our own uh, modules, components, or uh, subsystem products. But Apple, having many young, bright engineers, they claim to be uh, designed in California. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, they were more involved than other uh, companies, engineers. And also their uh, product requirements sometimes involved uh, taking a risk to what we normally uh, uh, 
were used to. So for example, uh, while other companies require the, the product itself uh, not to be failing after dropping from 1.5 meter high mm -hmm. uh, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, Apple uh, tried to lower that spec to one meter. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine a tall person holding up a phone next to his or her ear. It's roughly 1.5 meter. Mm -hmm. But because many of Apple's uh, design uh, uh, challenge the frontier of the technical specs, including tolerances, including uh, uh, dimensions. So our engineers would have to squeeze everything. And sometimes that involve a trade-off in other reliability specs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, at that time, uh, everybody knew him and knows him nowadays, Steve Jobs mm -hmm. was everywhere in the design, <laughs> even <laughs> in the uh, camera module. So uh, with every camera, normally that you would have this uh, filter film on top of the uh, uh, sort of like a cover, plastic cover mm -hmm. for the camera module. At that time, uh, with the digital steel camera, people are used to seeing the color in red uh, or uh, green. Mm -hmm. That's just because of the uh, uh, frequency, uh, 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 the, the, the spectrum mm -hmm. of that film. Uh, but however, Steve Jobs wanted to be bluish. <laughs> and you can have bluish, but the, uh, uh, the difficulty is that uh, it's a challenge on the manufacturing side. You have to change your overall production and you have to sacrifice some of the years just to have bluish film. <laughs> Even <laughs> on, the, though, on the cover. On the uh, cover. The, the plastic so, cover. So on the, uh, the, the first iPhone, it's a metal uh, cover on the back and, and, and surrounding the camera module is this black plastic. And underneath the, uh, or, or right on the hole, is, is this uh, bluish film. It has no effect on the photo imaging because it's not through the visible spectrum. The, the spectrum range. However, it looks good <laughs> with the rest of the iPhone. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so one requirement is they want bluish film. And at a very early stage, before we could even work with the film uh, supplier to change their manufacturing process, we literally have to handpick all the films that you know, uh, look bluish just to make the, 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 the product requirement. Right. The, the next requirement is that they require this film to be perfectly uh, uh, placed in the center of the hole. Mm -hmm. And that requires some uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, in invention, innovation on the manufacturing line. Mm -hmm. And so we have to design uh, some semi-automatic uh, equipment uh, just to align many things <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the uh, uh, assembly line, yeah. So were there technical challenges in the camera module itself in terms of the image making quality or whatever that, uh, that were also- They had a lot of requirements on the image quality. And at that time, the camera module um, for typical electronic products, you, you do it on an open space, meaning uh, no, uh, requirements on overall uh, 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 particle. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need a clean room or anything. You like. don't need a clean room. You need the area to be clean. Right. But camera, uh, because of the uh, the way that we assembled uh, the s sensor, which was from Micron, and the lens from Taiwan uh, Largan uh, at the times today, uh, uh, they are still the, the, the biggest suppliers to uh, uh, Apple on camera module. But when you have to assemble them, you need to do it in a clean room. And for that type of requirement, at that time for Premax, it was a first. We, 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 we sort of did it for digital steel camera, mm -hmm. but it was in very low uh, production. And for digital steel camera, it's not like a, a mobile phone in that big quantity. So mm -hmm. you could literally do it very carefully. But for a uh, camera module at that time, uh, this is uh, 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 you know, in the order of 
millions. So, right. so we had to do it, you know, in a, a class 1,000 clean room and 100 bench uh, um, for this. And Apple at that time, uh, compared to other mobile phone accessory, they were very uh, uh, particular about the uh, image quality. So literally for every mobile phone camera going out of line through the manufacturing process, we literally compensate uh, uh, digitally on every sensor's output. Hmm. And who, who did you, was there a primary person that you interfaced with at Apple? Who was the major contact you? We uh, interface with uh, uh, Apple's uh, sourcing and, and project management group. Uh, at that time, and so it was uh, a few people from the Cupertino area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for camera module, we mostly work with uh, 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 Lian, uh, still working for Apple at this time. <laughs> <laughs> Lian? Yeah, Lian, yeah. Uh, from the purchasing group. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, and when did you realize what? type of product this camera module was going to go into? Oh, we knew it was for mobile phones. You knew from it was for mobile start. phone. Yeah, okay. yeah because uh, 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 it's an embedded product, so nothing on the, on, on, on the, on the outside. <laughs> right. So we, we knew it was uh, for mobile phones, and other companies uh, also uh, tried at that time. Yeah, yeah, so and we just did not know what the phone would look like. Right. And so the, uh, the actual imaging uh, uh, semiconductor was from Micron, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And w was Micron a traditional supplier for you for your other, um, for your other digital camera work, or was uh, this it, different? It, uh, they, they were, yeah. They were not the only one. There are other uh, uh, sensors, for example, only vision at the time. But, but uh, Micron, Micron at that time was the uh, best sensor. Uh, the, the image sensor was uh, 2 megapixel. Mm -hmm. And the lens from Largan, uh, uh, at that time, Largan from Taiwan wasn't the, the world's best in terms of camera module uh, lens, but uh, they were more effective, cost efficient than Japanese uh, lens provider. Mm -hmm. So uh, today, uh, because of Apple and, and other products, Largan now is the uh, market leader for uh, camera lens. Hmm. Is Micron still a supplier? Yes. Um, so was this, uh, w you started working with Apple in 2005, was this sort of all-consuming? I mean, did it take, it, it required your full attention or was it just another program that had? I was in charge of all the uh, accessories that go into mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a few years, uh, Nokia was my biggest customer. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first few years for Apple that we, we knew it was big because uh, uh, 2005 that you have seen uh, iPod coming out, mm -hmm. but no one could uh, 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 expect iPhone to be that big uh, uh, coming before 2007. Right. But we definitely uh, uh, know that for high-end product, uh, it would have its place just because of history. We just did not expect it to dominate <laughs> in quality as well. Right. And I want to tell you a, a quick story that I've learned between transitioning from Nokia to uh, Apple. So iPod coming out of um, uh, uh, around year 2000, 2000 and, and, and one or so. So at that time, Nokia would have its supplier day uh, every year, so I was I was in Finland uh, uh, many trips, mm -hmm. and I, I visit Finland every month except mm -hmm. July when most of Europeans did not work. <laughs> 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 they took the whole month off. But there was one supplier day, uh, roughly around 2003 and 2004. The CEO of Nokia came out and announced to the suppliers two major objectives. One is that they will increase their market share from 35 at that time to 40%. Mm -hmm. This is their commitment to the uh, board of the uh, uh, company, yeah. yeah, and also to the shareholders. Right. The next big commitment that CEO made 
at that supplier day is that they would own the music space online because Apple just introduced iTunes uh, no more than two to three years. Mm -hmm. It was a major success. Mm -hmm. So Nokia said that we own the mobile phones and we could own the online music space. The next year, I went to the supplier day. The same CEO announced uh, to the uh, audience that after one year of unsuccessful business, ramping from 35% uh, to 40%, uh, you know why? Because all their customers, AT&T, uh, Orange, etc., say Nokia should not own their customers. They should own the music space because at the time, as big as Nokia was, they had to sell their phones through their uh, telecom operators, right. not direct sales, right. not like Apple did right. it right. later. So they resisted buying Nokia phones. They tried to sell other phones. So Nokia market share not went up from 35%, but went down. And that was a bigger commitment than getting into the music space. So the following year, the CEO of Nokia said to people, they will try again, moving from 35% to 40%, but they withdrew from online music. And that gave way to Apple. I saw that as a major turning point mm -hmm. uh, for Apple, uh, but also given credit to Steve Jobs and his crew, in making Apple the phones that everybody uh, like. But however, for an incumbent leader at that time to self-reinvent is a, a, a channel to the consumers. Not going through operator was very hard. Was very hard. So, 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 so Apple did go directly to the consumer. They had no other way because right. uh, no one would give revenue share <laughs> to <laughs> Apple. So at that time, uh, even mobile phone was the biggest uh, uh, device, uh, much bigger than notebook. Uh, also the camera was coming in uh, uh, just uh, in the early stage. People saw this as a, a major business. Mm -hmm. And at that time, all the channels were controlled by the operators. They control your monthly programs, etc., And the phones, uh, need to be sold by the telecom operators. So, so Apple uh, had no other ways but try to go direct to the consumers. And Steve Jobs had his personal uh, marketing genius mm -hmm. and, and, and try to use the consumer to uh, pull demand from mm -hmm. the operators. And mm -hmm. they don't operate, uh, even share revenues uh, with the Apple, but not with previous mobile phone leaders. So it was a good story telling people that as an incumbent, uh, usually you are destined to fall because it's very hard for you to, to cut your arm and legs to reinvent yourself. Right, right. So did, I forget, did Nokia then go direct? Uh, or they always work through the operators, even they, after they, Apple? A few years later, after they withdrew from the music online space, they tried to go back in again with online music, with gaming. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Apple was already big, yeah, and and, and, and history tends tended, tends to repeat itself. Nokia uh, overtook Motorola majority because of its UI UX, mm -hmm. which much more friendly. Mm -hmm. With the motor phone, that is an engineer's uh, 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 darling, but it's not to the uh, normal consumer that you have to go through the right. menu yes. to get to, you know, how you want to access. People uh, give it credit to uh, Apple for what they, they, they do today with the touch screen, et cetera. But at that time, Nokia had similar uh, advantage over Moto, but they were not able to uh, reinvent itself with a better uh, OS system operating system. Right. So Symbian at that time was good, but mm -hmm. it was not as good as apples in right. terms of simplicity. Right. Yeah. So, so simplicity would be the, the key thing. So, <laughs> so Nokia was better than Moto in UI UX, but much less than Apple. Than Apple yeah. yeah. So who knows who else could
could overtake <laughs> Apple. Exactly. Had to be still, uh, uh, you know, uh, exactly. going back to the consumers. Yeah. yeah, they need to feel good about it and 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 feel that it's easy to use. All right. So uh, you continued working with Apple for through two or three generations of uh, iPhones. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, uh, I left Premax uh, after two generations of iPhones. Mm -hmm. The company after I left, uh, continue to uh, 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 be Apple's supplier, at least on the uh, uh, mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Later it was for uh, Mac and, and uh, the uh, trackpad, mouse, and other products. Uh, so I left the company in uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. yeah. So get, just to dig a little deeper there, did um did you make frequent trips, to, or did maybe somebody in your group make frequent trips to Cupertino to work with Apple? Did they did they go come to your place? What was the mode of uh, interaction? It was uh, 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 mutual. So um, there are many trips that we came to uh, Cupertino for business discussion, for uh, new ideas, for. Uh, 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 product review, etc. Uh, you know, there were even uh, uh, short trips. I remember there was uh, one trip at that time that uh, my uh, VP at the time, Brian, and myself took uh, a long flight from Taiwan, uh, roughly 12 hours or so, uh, came into Cupertino for one hour of meeting. Then when we went back, twelve hours on, right. on the same day. <laughs> on the same and day. On, on the same day, but not directly. Uh, we went back, uh, going through Japan, uh -huh. visit Nokia sourcing, and turn around that we uh, uh, went through uh, airport hotel in uh, um, Bangkok, <laughs> slept at the airport uh, hostel for one night, went to Nokia. Finland, <laughs> Helsinki, <laughs> uh, for a meeting, but that was the time. Yeah. Then on the Apple side, uh, because they claim to uh, be involved in designing, so they tend, compared to other mobile phone manufacturers, their engineers tend to be more involved mm -hmm. uh, in the products or uh, modules themselves. So they came by waves, literally, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to uh, our design center in Taiwan, to our manufacturing in China. And uh, they were young and very uh, good at learning. So uh, I remember at the very first generation of the camera module, our people uh, would have to teach them about some product and technical knowledge. So for example, optics lenses, etc. But there were, you know, uh, young talents from universities, even the sourcing people, engineering people, they were fast learners. So by mm -hmm. the time that second generation, etc., you know, they, they, they got very good <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in many of the uh, technical aspects. They, they knew how to ask questions and, and, and learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a few things that uh, that impressed us is that you know they, they come with shorts and sandals, <laughs> <laughs> true Apple spirit. Yeah, and, and you know at, at that time that uh, you know it was uh, a a good you know uh, team spirit from both sides. Yeah, so we were in factory, we were at dinner, sometimes you know uh, uh, singing at Kate, uh, karaoke, <laughs> karaoke. etc. Yeah, yeah, but it was a, a good team bonding. Yeah. So did they ever? Did they have another competitive company also doing the same thing at the same time? Or uh, not the very first time. So usually the OEM, ODM business that uh, for product design, uh, they might have uh, uh, two suppliers working together. But mm -hmm. usually, because sometimes these uh, design would have to uh, 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 be standardized, mm -hmm. uh, at least in spec, dimension, etc. Right. So so. Uh, uh, the early phase, there might be some competing proposal, but very soon they will lock in into one design. Then later on in the production stage, they will have some uh, dual sourcing uh, uh, as a, a minimum standard just because of risk management. Mm -hmm. But 
uh, uh, in the first couple of uh, iPhone generation, we were the only one. But when it comes to um, uh, production, uh, later on, Foxconn, Honghai, you know, uh, they would share part of it. Yeah. But, but we were the, the majority share, usually it was like a 60-40 or 70-30 split. So early on, uh, well, at least through that first generation and in the second generation, it sounds like there was a very cooperative team spirit working and you were both working hard together to, to achieve this goal, is that right? Yes, 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 yeah. So it sounds like there were not, I mean, they had some certain specifications and certain requirements that were unusual or different, but. Mo but overall, the, the it was not a major technical challenge to do what they were asking. Is that correct? Uh, it was not a technical uh, innovation, but it was an uh, engineering integration. Okay. So you know, usually, like it's very typical of uh, iPhone. You you have this touch screen. You have, for example, Siri. But majority of it is not new technology, right. but putting it together and also design it in a way that people like it, or uh, 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 it's uh, uh, as simple as kids that can and feel it. I think that was the key for Apple's uh, early success. I remember the, the, during the peak days of Nokia, Nokia would show a, a photo of um, uh, soccer, uh, uh, star Beckenham arriving mm -hmm. at Tokyo. All the fans and, and also media uh, bring out the, the, the camera and, and taking pictures of um, Beckenham. And they will count how many phones are, how many cameras are phones mm -hmm. versus how many cameras are digital steel camera right. to show the, 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 the progress. Yes. Um, but uh, similarly with uh, uh, iPhone, is certainly an, an icon, uh, and it was a, a, a beauty uh, to be uh, uh, accepted by the consumer and also respected by the manufacturer like us who are very involved. I had one uh, phone stand, not electronic uh, uh, function, but a stand that supports the iPhone in the, in the first two generations, uh, literally at that time. Uh, because uh, contrary to other mobile phone makers, you will announce the f new phone models and have the product ready in three months mm -hmm. to other people. Apple, Steve Jobs would announce it on the same day and you can buy it after the announcement. Mm -hmm. But before then, it's totally secretive, right. confidential. So you could imagine for the supply chain, we would have to manufacture it, ship it, you know, across the ocean or by uh, airplane and arrive it just before the announcement day. Everything needs to be, you know, uh, very hush-hush. So, you know, people would be surprised right after right. the announcement. And right. that was a major challenge. So, so there was one phone stand just two days before the announcement. Steve Jobs took a look of every product he was about to introduce, and he decided that that stand was too close to another product, so he decided to not announce it. Not announcing is a nice word, but killing it <laughs> is in reality. So you could imagine we have products in their warehouse ready to go into the store. We have products that's in shipment. We have products in our factory and we kill the total product. We kill the, and, and obviously Apple compensated uh, with uh, uh, some uh, 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 revenues from the next product, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it was a total uh, nightmare for everybody, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that was the Apple way. And later on, because Steve Jobs' uh, way of doing it, it was not possible to keep everything so secretive before the announcement. They, so later on, they changed that practice. But I remember through the first two generations of the phones, um, they were doing things different than others. Mm. Announce it right away, you could buy it now. Right. They announce it, uh, maybe you buy it 
one month or, or two to three months later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like before because it was so hard to keep everything secret. <laughs> yeah, you have thousands, you know, of people working on this product, and, and that's so, why you see some photos leaking out, etc. Yeah. So, did you did you see any leaked photos or whatever of the iPhone before it was announced? I mean, did you ever know what there the end always, product? There uh, were uh, always, uh, you know, rumors and, and false pictures uh, at that time. Yeah, yeah, but but because for us, we work on the module, we do not touch the whole phone. Right. So uh, we we tend to. Uh, uh, stay out of it uh, a bit easier, yeah. But but we, we at that time we kept on, you know, hearing people and and, and at that time uh, the way that we kept everything confidential is that all the phones that are used to test the modules uh, usually they are in a secret box to protect its appearance being seen if you use it outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the normal practice with Nokia with the Motorola. Even with module makers or accessory makers, we have to test the, 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 the phones at some point mm -hmm. uh, together. And as a reputable manufacturing partner, we honor those um, practice. So at the time, we all use code names in uh, our manufacturing factory. We are not to say anywhere outside of our own group that, oh, this is for Nokia phone and this is for uh, uh, iPhone. So I remember that for Apple's phone, at least the first two generation, our codename is Q. <laughs> for Nokia, it was X. <laughs> so we say, oh, X project, X customer, but you know, uh, we try to uh, keep our reputation that way. Right, and so you know, I know Apple had their engineers working behind locked doors and very limited access. Did you have a similar kind of thing to protect? Yeah, your we would have to have this, uh, uh, we call uh, China Wall, right? So different teams working for uh, different customers. All the uh, uh, project or documents uh, literally uh, should not show customer name. And that's why we have this code name yeah, right. uh, for different customers, different uh, projects. We also have SOPs of carrying phones or our modules, you know, in uh, uh, transition from one engineering room to uh, another factory. And in the factory, we would have very high security mm -hmm. of keeping the workers uh, not taking any parts or products out. Yeah, but but as you know, that this is a big logistic management. You know, literally thousands of people having their hands <laughs> on, on these type of uh, products, but it was up to uh, our uh, manufacturing management to keep everything the way that customer wants it. Right. Yeah. One other story that I like to share is that because the way that we set up this uh, cream room, so uh, uh, at one time, uh, there's a group of Apple engineers coming to our factory. And we knew when you asked the question about how many uh, competitors in the design stage, we knew that Apple came to us after some stint of working with uh, uh, Japanese vendors. And at that time, we all knew that Japanese you know, uh, are leaders of the camera, digital steel camera. Mm -hmm. And so it was no surprise that they had gone to uh, Japan to ask for vendors to work with them. And we, uh, we, we show Apple customers through our manufacturing line in, uh, in China, southern part of, uh, of uh, uh, China. And I estimate roughly I had 250 people working on certain capacity of line in clean room uh, facility. So I asked my Apple customer at that time, my previous, their previous vendor in Japan, uh, because of their reputation of being highly automatic in China that uh, I, I, I knew that we uh, uh, had some advantage of um, labor quality and cost, mm -hmm. but not in terms of automation. So I asked the customer the question that how many people were there for similar capacity in Japan? Mm -hmm. I remember he showed me this. <laughs> So I had 250 people, so I was thinking, 20? 
that few. We know our uh, labor uh, productivity ratio is maybe three to four, but definitely not intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he told me two. Two people? Two people. Okay. It was that highly automated production line. So my next question is that, then why did you trans the, transfer the order to a Taiwanese manufacturer like us doing this in China? And it was then, you know, things sort of uh, uh, unveiled later that usually Japanese manufacturing line were highly automated. And so they could do everything with very few people. And, and obviously a line like that with two people, it would have to be fully automated, heavily engineered design. However, when you work with Pap Apple, one thing is that Steve Jobs changes all the time. So he changed the spec, he changed the idea, and the minute that he changes it, he changed it, all the you know, Apple's uh, uh, engineering team, the, uh, the Taiwan manufacturing team, we have to change accordingly, and we have to do it right at the line. With a fully automatic manufacturing line, you could not possibly do that. I see. Within one day or two, it would have to be you know, right. weeks or a month because you have to do all the uh, Reprogram reprogramming everything. and the refixturing, the tooling design, and with Japanese style, everything have to be requalified. And for us in Taiwan, we do what the customer asks us to do. <laughs> so I just remember this, <laughs> two people. <laughs> and I still remember this. So today that we are talking a lot about uh, Industrial 4.0, it's about combining the expertise from both country, mm -hmm. uh, the manufacturing style, mm -hmm. that you need to have automation, you need to have this uh, cyber physical uh, combination type of system, but at the end of the day, you need to be uh, flexible to accommodate uh, something like Apple's uh, design style, do it on the fly, everything for the consumers right. and for manufacturing and for their engineering team. Right. You just have to do it right. <laughs> and do it <laughs> within hours. <laughs> That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so is there anything, do you have any other stories like that or any? Uh, well, let me ask you one thing. The, uh, so Micron was the source of the imaging thing. Was that a standard product for them or did they have to do any customization to meet the requirements for in it? In the... Uh, uh, in the first couple of generation, uh, it was uh, a semi customer uh, specs. A at the time, you know, uh, Micron CEO was a good friend of Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah, so they were flying together, etc. Yeah, uh, that was the time for their ex CEO uh, uh, a as a as a pilot as a hobby. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, remember that Micron was in the digital steel camera. So this whole mobile uh, camera, I would say that it was through the market leaders like Nokia and Apple that really took it to the uh, next stage. Mm -hmm. So for the uh, sensors, obviously the, 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 the pixel image size and uh, the way it is calibrated, uh, they will have to do some customization for mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And now uh, this is the uh, standard, so, so most of these uh, uh, sensor companies see mobile phone business, but in the future, uh, maybe IoT devices, uh, these will be big, big business for them. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, so uh, you then, are there any other things that you think we should cover with respect to the program with Apple? Is that uh, sort of? That's pretty much everything, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, uh, obviously, Foxconn is there, Honghai is there, big, uh, manufacturing partner, mm -hmm. and at that time, uh, we uh, uh, work with them, and also we had to compete with them because of the dual sourcing. And mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they were many war stories, but <laughs> uh, Apple was uh, uh, pretty good to us because, uh, as a small and medium company, we were much smaller than uh, Honghai at the time. You know, we, we, we did our part pretty good, especially uh, they asked a lot of these. Uh, uh, sort of like uh, ID specs that are very extreme. Mm -hmm. And we are able to use manual way and also semi-automatic way in terms of assembly, inspection, 
uh, and also uh, design. And we were the, the first leader and Apple would take our design uh, or the uh, manufacturing equipment and share with uh, Honghai. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because uh, they are the other partner. Yeah, yeah so okay. there were a lot so of stories. Is, yeah. Honai and Foxconn, are they just in yeah, the same company, China yeah. or they? They were in, in, in China already. Yeah, so we were shipping from one factory to another factory. Did they have a factory in Taiwan or? Own? But at that time, it was all in China all, already. Right. Yeah, but all the R&D uh, people are uh, mostly in Taiwan for us. Uh, Honghai has some uh, manufacturing engineer in uh, in China, yeah. But all the factories were in in China already. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay. Um, so w you left uh, Premax in, in two thousand and eight. Two thousand eight. Yeah. And uh, where did you go from there? I went back to uh, consulting in China uh, from two thousand eight to two thousand and nine. Uh, working for Roland Berger, uh, a strategy cons consulting company from uh, Germany. Then in 2009, uh, I came back to uh, Taiwan working for e mm -hmm. And uh, what brought you back there and what, what has been your role at e -Tree? You've been at e -Tree since then? Since 2009. So it was through a headhunter asking for a, a, a person with a consulting experience uh, coming to e -Tree to lead uh, uh, a group of uh, market research team working on advanced technology trends and also uh, uh, industry trends. So today I have roughly around 250 people working for me on different types of high-tech manufacturing and also a little bit on service and agriculture. Mm -hmm. yeah, so for e -Tree, it's the largest uh, NGO uh, institute working on commercialization of, of advanced applied technology. So we are like a, a SRI, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in US and from Harvard in Germany. So yeah. you're doing actual research, our research work? My organization works on uh, uh, different industries, uh, economics and technology trends. Mm -hmm. I do not do any R&D, but majority of e uh, uh nearly uh, 6,000 engineers working on uh, the actual R&D uh, 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 work in labs. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, uh, is some of that work in autonomous vehicles? By oh yes, <laughs> yeah. So it's just about everything except uh, defense, I would say, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So we work on autonomous vehicle, AR, VR, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and, and in U.S., we are a constant um, uh, uh, award winner on RD100. So, so every year we would uh, win roughly around uh, three to uh, six RD100. You know, out of a hundred uh, awards that we we would win win uh, uh, three to six. So mm -hmm. usually we are either the 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 first or the second winner in terms of the number of awards mm -hmm. in RD100 since 2008. Mm. And we receive about three patents awarded every day. So, mm. so in US, we are the largest non-private corporate entity that has this uh, highest uh, mm. uh, uh, patents awarded because US previously it was Bell Labs. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it was right. separate into different entities. So right. you know, IBM, etc. They were much bigger, but they were private entities. But right. uh, for a non-private entity, each is up there in terms of the uh, technical, yeah, uh, achievement. Yeah. So what is the the state of uh, manufacturing and and uh, you know high tech manufacturing and development in Taiwan? I, my impression is that. It had a very strong period in you know, manufacturing personal computers and that sort of thing. Yeah. How has that changed? What is the major activity now? The what most are the of the, for example, mobile phones, most of it uh, were moved out of Taiwan. HTC has uh, some left, mm -hmm. but HTC's uh, uh, share uh, is not big nowadays. The majority of the manufacturing in Taiwan uh, uh, would focus still on semiconductors. 
So for example, TSMC in Foundry, MediaTek in uh, Logic IC, mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, Packaging. Uh, the other semiconductor related industry, the, the largest one is uh, Display, mm -hmm. uh, Panel Makers, and also uh, LEDs. LEDs, uh, these are, are still big in, in Taiwan. And the, the next industry after semiconductor industry uh, would be uh, LEDs, uh, no, sorry, uh, would be in uh, uh, machinery. So like uh, uh, tool machines, uh, uh, they are still in Taiwan. What areas are you trying to move Taiwan into? What areas would you like to grow substantially? Semiconductor by far is the uh, uh, world leading uh, competency for yeah. us uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and also uh, we uh, have calculated its uh, uh, proliferating uh, impact on other industries, mm -hmm. uh, backward and forward, and also its uh, indirect impact on consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was very big for us. So um, for us, to move forward, uh, obviously we need to leverage this industry for others. So for example, we are uh, trying to leverage for uh, Internet of Things mm -hmm. based on the semiconductors. Mm -hmm. And also uh, even uh, we are not a big country when it comes to uh, artificial intelligent development uh, like US, China, and, and, and Europe. But however, the uh, uh, our expertise in the IC design, we could combine some of the algorithm in mm -hmm. embedded ICs and put it into in some of the, uh, uh, for example, edge devices. We, we look into the future. Not everything will be in the cloud. So when it comes to uh, local computing, again, uh, they would have to leverage on these semiconductor uh, ICs, et cetera, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where that we'll be able uh, to have a bit of our uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. So for the past 20 years or so, Taiwan is, uh, was not successful in pure software business, mm -hmm. so like internet, et cetera. But now we are talking about IoT, AI embedded in uh, uh, IC. Right. That's where Taiwan uh, could uh, come back again. Yeah. Right. And part of your program is also to, to uh, cooperate with universities in, in the United States or elsewhere to uh, tap into their R&D programs, is that? Uh... R&D program and also collaboration. So we have a, a long uh, history of uh, collaborating with the university uh, from US. Mm -hmm. uh, today, maybe roughly uh, uh, seven or uh, eight ongoing program including Stanford and Berkeley. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and because of uh, uh, US direction in bringing back manufacturing uh, uh, jobs to the US and also uh, putting investment in the uh, advanced manufacturing uh, technology, mm -hmm. we also participated in some of the uh, programs, uh, for example, uh, flexible electronics, uh, uh, 3D printing, et cetera, because uh, we, we view it as that uh, by working with uh, US uh, on these uh, uh, four fronts of technology development, we also help put some of the uh, Taiwanese uh, companies mm -hmm. in the ecosystem, not by ourselves, yeah. Right. Because we do not view Taiwan uh, uh, being a country that can continue to do uh, mass manufacturing but getting to this uh, high-end manufacturing, working with uh, market leaders like US and German companies, uh, Taiwan indirectly will benefit some of the companies' headquarters in right. Taiwan. So right. for example, uh, shale gas, shale oil is a big thing in US. You know, we have uh, uh, petrochemical companies that come into US for the uh, investment. Ideally, uh, for a country, we like to keep them in Taiwan, but we know it's not possible to do that. So how to have investment in U.S. and also uh, have some indirect benefits for the headquarters 
uh, uh, located in Taiwan, and mm -hmm. that's gonna be our direction. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover with respect to your current activities, or? Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, okay. I think that uh, Taiwan being a small country, uh, we want to be a strategic part of the whole ecosystem, right. including many of these uh, innovation coming out of the U.S.